In the northeast of India, wedged between China, Bangladesh, and Myanmar lie four states. And these four states, they share a dark history, a common history. They're tribes. For centuries, they've been bloodthirsty. There's been bloodshed throughout their history. And the term headhunting actually comes from one of their practices. You think headhunting is what happens in LinkedIn. It's not. Their rite of passage to being a male adult is to actually bring the physical head of someone on a stake. That's where the, the terminology head hunting comes from. They're so violent and bloodthirsty that when the British colonized India, they didn't even venture to go out there because they got burned too many times. They said, let's just leave them alone. But then Christian missionaries started arriving. They're a famous bunch. They'll go places where you and I won't dare to go. So in the late 19th century, early 20th century, after the revival in Wales, Wales and other parts of America, Europe, and other parts of Asia, these people started trickling in to these states. And after 70 years of preaching the gospel, and after 70 years of prayer, and after 70 years of leading people into repentance, something significant happened. Today, out of a nation that says 80% of 1.4 billion people that worship idols, these four states are the most Christian majority states. They are an anomaly in the nation of India. They are an anomaly to the narrative about India. Who says India cannot be saved? The majority of them, over 90% of them are believers. They did a survey, the highest church attendance in the world, on the planet, is in these four states. They cannot build buildings large enough to accommodate the hunger of people. My question today is, can people like these, who have a barbaric past, who have an ungodly past, be saved? Could states be revived even in this day? Could a nation be revived in our times? I want to take you to the story when a nation was revived. Let's turn to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 7. 1 Samuel chapter 7 verses 2 to 4. Reading from the ESV, the glorified version. From the day that the ark was launched, that was Mike Gretschko who said that to me. From the day that the ark was launched at Kiriat Jerem. A long time passed, some 20 years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. And Samuel said to all the house of Israel, if you are returning to the Lord with all of your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtaroth from among you and direct your heart to the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the people of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtaroth and they served the Lord only. Tonight I want to talk to you from the topic, revival from the inside out. Look to a neighbor and say, revival from the inside out. I want to give you some context to the passage we just read. Three chapters ago from where we are here, Israel had gone into battle. They were confident. They were armed and equipped and ready. They had the Ark of the Covenant with them, go into battle with them. They had the priest's sons go with them. They raised up a mighty sound and the enemy was trembling. But in a significant turn of events, they were defeated. How many of you have been defeated when you felt you were going to win? And these people got defeated. 34,000 men were killed that day. The sons of the priests were killed in battle. The Ark of the Covenant, the power and presence of God itself, the Ark was carried away by their enemies. And the priest of the nation, hearing the bad news, he was a big guy like me. He was leaning on a chair. He fell down, hit his neck on the floor, snapped his neck and died. Pretty gruesome story to begin with, but stay with me. 
It is at this point, and then for the next 20 years, they were subjugated and enslaved by their enemies. Israel as a nation was materially, emotionally, physically, and finally spiritually bankrupt, and they were defeated. The story of this group of people is often the parallel of our lives. We may feel defeated on all or some fronts, What are you talking about revival? I'm trying to be in survival. At Newman Church, we've been talking revival for so many years. And we as a state and a nation, we're talking about survival. Our health system is barely surviving. Our economy is barely on the lifeline. And many families in many places in and around this country are barely in survival mode. What on earth are you talking about revival? So I want to tell you something. There's something that this man and this group of people that they did that it led them from a treacherous place of defeat to revival. And I'm here to tell you one story. If you have walked in here with survival mode activated, you're going to leave this place with revival mode activated on. You want to go from survival to revival. And what's the first thing that they did? Well, revival begins with repentance. In verse two, it says, a long time passed, some 20 years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. I wanna unpack that word lamented. Sounds commonly like fermented. But they were fermenting in lament, and lament means a passionate expression of sorrow and grief. And for 20 years, they were in a passionate expression of sorrow and grief. But sorrow and grief alone doesn't take you closer to revival. More often than not, we think that when we come into a service, the remorse that we feel, the guilt that we feel, the tears that we have, and the great confession and the great tears and the weeping, is revival. No, it's not. It's got to take you further. And that's what Samuel did here. Samuel realized that if my people had to go back to God and if God had to revive my nation, it's got to go beyond tears. It's got to go beyond sorrow. It's got to go beyond grief. And this is the first thing Samuel tells them. Hey, if you want to turn to the Lord with all your heart, repent. Like the people of Israel, we too can be far away from the Lord. But it is important to know tonight, don't remain in lament. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, it says, Godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Whichever way you look at it, 20 years is a long period of time to being committed to lament but it just wasn't enough. You gotta go from lament, you gotta go from grief, you gotta go from being remorseful to being repentant. If Samuel wouldn't have intervened at that point, you'd still be reading about these guys stuck in grief, stuck in lament. And it happens to all of us, it happens to the best of us. Oh, I wish my marriage hadn't broken down. Oh, I wish my relationship hadn't crumbled. Or I wish I hadn't been addicted to that. Or I wish that hadn't happened to me when I was young. And I'm talking my own relationship stories. I'm talking my own story. I'm not pointing out to anyone. I'm saying, but it's got to go beyond grief. It's got to go beyond lament. It's got to go beyond a remorse. And it's got to move to repentance. That's right. That's right. What is repentance? Well, repentance is a complete change of mind, a completely brand new way of thinking. Well, how does that happen, Pastor Joe? Well, we have the Word of God. It's the Word of God that leads us to repentance. It's His kindness that leads us to repentance. It's not you and me. It's not dependent on my actions and your actions. It's when we come humbly and submit before God and His Word and, and His kindness that leads us to a place of repentance. Boyd K. Packer said, repentance is the key with which we can unlock the prison from the inside. We hold the key within our hands and agency is ours to use it. 
Too often we are looking for the next conference, the next revival night, the next service to lead us to a place. We are actually looking for the next pastor to minister to us, to lead us into repentance and then from there to revival. Can I tell you something? It's yours to own, baby. It's yours to own. Pastor Corey's fire, his responsibility. My fire, my responsibility. Your fire, your responsibility. The the staff team, their repentance, their responsibility. Your repentance, your responsibility. Let's take ownership as a church. Well, if repentance is a change of mind, how can it lead us to revival? Well, the second thing is revival requires your whole heart. That's what they committed to. The second thing they committed to, this group of people, revival requires your whole heart. And in verse three, it says, if you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, when we return to God, he doesn't need some of our hearts. He doesn't require almost all of it. He wants all of it. I sometimes wonder how the people of Israel repeatedly found themselves in these circumstances. Well, this was not a one-off event where they just had an oopsie. This was a 450 year cycle. On again, off again, on again, off again, on again with God, now off again. And if you actually do a quick reading of the Old Testament, you would come across the same pattern three times in five minutes. And you're like, these people. But you know, once when I was reading like that, I'm thinking, man, these guys are really stiff-necked people. And the Holy Spirit says, well, what's different now? What's different now? The condition of the human heart has been the same, whether it was 2000 BC or 2020 AD. It's the same. And so the nation of Israel had the law, they had the covenant, they had the commandments, they had the Levites, they had the judges, they had the prophets, they had the ark, they had the tabernacle, they had the worship team, they had their songs, they had their prayers, they had their intercessors, but their heart was far away from God. And it's important that we recognize that even us, the people called by God, The people that Jesus paid with his own body and his blood. The people who have the new covenant. The people filled with the Holy Spirit. The people having new modern buildings and worship and songs and everything else that's supposed to bring us close to God. We can still be disconnected on the inside. For revival to be sustained... None of the above things that I mentioned earlier is a substitute for a heart that is wholly surrendered to God. Two weeks ago, Pastor Stacy preached an amazing sermon. Can I encourage you, if you have not yet seen it, it's called The First Love. If you have not yet seen it, please go have a listen. It's an important word in the life of our church. Share it with your friends and family. And that sermon, Pastor Stacy talked to us about the church of Ephesus. That had great leaders, that had great works. It had a great location, it had a great amphitheater. And they were a greatly influential church, but they had forgotten their first love. God was not at the center of their whole heart. And in their hearts, they were divorced from God. And from from when that prophetic warning went to that church, 10 years after that, they ceased to exist. Not Numa Church. Not on our watch, not in Melbourne, not on our watch. Mark chapter 12, verse 30, it says, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. There's a whole lot of all your. But the, the author is trying to emphasize, emphasize all your heart, not some of it not a portion of it. Don't hold nothing back. You wanna see revival in your lifetime, don't hold anything back. Lay it all on the altar. When we no longer surrender our whole heart to the Lord, we disqualify ourselves from experiencing the fullness of God and the reviving power of the Holy Spirit. How do we know if we have surrendered our whole heart to the Lord? 
Look for other idols. Look for other idols. Open the closet. What do you find? Too often in our lives, there are other gods competing. There's an Olympics, a God Olympics happening in your heart. Fighting for the medal tally of your heart. Fighting for your devotion. What were these foreign gods that these guys had committed themselves to? Well, weird names, Baal and Ashtaroth. They were Canaanite gods. Baal was the male deity that controlled, supposedly controlled, all of the forces of nature. And they needed the forces of nature to smile on them because they were anyways being oppressed from an enemy beyond the border. The last thing they wanted is their crops to fail and their bank balance to dry up. So they were pleadingly trying to please this God. Hey, don't dry up my crops. I've got my veggie patch here. I need it to prosper. I've got my bank balance there with NAB. I don't want it to shrink. What was the Asherah? The goddess of fertility. They believed it controlled their sexuality. It controlled their, their fruitfulness. This is the very select group of people that God in personally invited for the very first Mount Sinai conference and gave them the latest tablets and said, you shall have no other gods before me. And forever and a day, he's been saying the same thing, but for 450 years, they were still chasing other gods. Yet time and time again, they would yield in to the desires of their heart. Why? Because it gave their flesh pleasure. Both the Baal and Ashtaroth were sexual and erotic in nature. It involved people prostituting themselves to it. As a culture, we have an unhealthy obsession with sexuality. It's tight, but it's right. It's everywhere. It's in the media. I'm just borrowing it from you. It's in our song lyrics. It's in our comedy. It's in our movies. It's in our TV shows. It's in sport. It's in news. Flash news. 40% of all the news content is dedicated to sexuality. And even the stupid KFC ad has something about sexuality. The other day, I kid you not, I saw an ad. I was watching Bluey with my kids. And this KFC ad pops up and I was like, why is that guy putting the drumstick like that? It's everywhere. And it's an unhealthy obsession, whether you like it or not, whether you realize or not, it's out there. It's singing its song. It's sending its message. It's trying to capture your attention. And you might be sitting here thinking, well, Pastor Joe, I can confirm, I don't have any Baals and Ashtaroth in my living room. We do not have any idols in our home. You might not have idols made of metal, clay, or wood. But I'll tell you what an idol is, what an idol looks like. Anything, say, say this word after me, anything or anyone that seeks to appoint itself in your life and tries to shape the way you think, the way you speak, the way you act, and the way you behave is an idol. Anything. It could be social media could be Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram. It could be the need for likes. It could be the addiction to validation. It could be gaming. My kids asked me earlier this week, did you have PlayStation? I'm like, what's that? (laughs) That's how old I am. It could be Netflix. Hours upon hours of endless, mindless dedication to something playing on the screen with your chicken leg in your hand. (laughs) Any voice of this world that seeks to control you or shape your mind or your life is an idol. And if you're there in that space, can I encourage you, this is not a Bible bash. 
ceremony. This is not to condemn you. It's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. Despite all of that that we harbor, the idolatry that we harbor in our hearts, unknowingly, the kindness of God has ensured that he hasn't checked out of the building. And just like the 2,000 years ago or thousands of years ago, how he showed up to his people and said, return back to me. I want your heart. I want all of it. He's still saying the same message tonight. Return back to me. Come back to your first love. This revival will be a revival of the first love. And sometimes these idols are not sinister. It could be work. It could be family. It could even be ministry. In the words of Jesus, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters. Yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Jesus wasn't asking to literally hate. It was an exaggeration to prove a point saying, you got to place me priority than anything else. You got to put me first beyond anything else. The most common phrase that we pastors hear when we invite our friends to a midweek meeting is, hey, I've got work. I'm really super duper busy. So I ask the question, are you happy? And the answer most often is, I hate my boss, my colleagues are jerks, I don't get paid enough. (laughs) Yet somehow, we wear this medal of overwork and underpay as a badge of honor. We have elevated our God-given means to make a living as an idol. It's taken full center stage of our lives. Now, don't hear me what I'm not saying. We all need to work hard. We all need to make a living. We all need to provide for our families and work hard while at it. But family and work cannot be elevated above God. And unless we get rid of the idols that command our devotion, we will not be able to yield ourselves to the one true God. And once we've gotten rid of our idols, how do we posture our hearts for revival? Well, lastly, revival requires that we only serve God. Verse 4, it says, serve him only. Look to your neighbor and say, serve God alone. You can do better than that. That person snoozing, just give them a holy shake. Give them a holy rumble and say, serve God alone. Well, this is a big challenge for us in the modern day because everything in this world is trying to grab our attention and take us away from serving God. And it happens to the best of us. In fact, it even happened to Jesus himself. In Matthew chapter four, we see Satan tempting Jesus right after prayer and fasting, mind you. So be on the lookout. He comes to him and he promises him the satisfaction of the flesh. Offers him wealth, riches, power and position. And I love how Jesus gives him a slap down and says in Matthew 4, 10, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only will you serve. Tonight we have a choice. Who are we serving? Either you will serve God and his purposes or the dominant force in this world will take you in its submission. When you walk away from serving the Lord, don't think you're getting free time. Do not think for a minute you're free, but you're automatically subservient of the elementary principles of this world. Romans chapter 6 verse 16, it says, Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? I am believing for the day where pastors and leaders will never have to encourage anyone to join and serve teams. I am believing for the day we will never have to announce from platform or on social media, we need more people to serve in the house of God. Let me tell you a story about our church in Bangkok. I did a bit of snooping around in my trip 
last time and I found out on an average they earn between $12,000 and $16,000 a year. Let that sink in for a minute. They earn between $12,000 and $16,000 Aussie dollars a year. Yet there's half a dozen of them. There's actually a dozen of them who've been saving money for a whole year, putting towards flight and accommodation. Why? Because they want to come here and serve you all. Their heart is they want to come and serve, not attend. I'd be giving them full marks if they were just coming to attend, but they've gone above and beyond. They're saying, we want to come and serve our church. We want to come and serve our brothers and sisters in Australia. We have been blessed because of what you guys are doing in Australia. So we want to come and serve. How good is that? How awesome is that? You have never met them. You have never seen them face to face. But in the spirit, they have received you as an inheritance. They have received you as brothers and sisters. And they have made it upon themselves as a mission to come here and serve this house. And you will get to meet them in the next few weeks. And yet there are many people in our church here, my brothers and sisters, I say that with ownership, it's on me, who find the 20 minute drive too hard to come serve once a month. In this passage, serving the Lord came with the promise of deliverance. We as a church need freedom. We as a people need freedom. Our young adults need freedom. Our adults need freedom. Our parents need freedom. I know it's hard to raise kids and, and be committed in the things of God. I know it. I've done it. I'm still doing it. It's hard. You're getting one ready, the other one's pooped their pants. And then you get that ready and the other one's gone the other way. It's hard, man. It's hard. I understand it. But don't check out for the next five years because you've had a baby. You pray for months to get a good job and a good promotion. And then when you get promoted, you get promoted into the heavenlies and never seen you ever again. <laughs> Don't disappear. And then you come back after 10 years. Oh, I've lost it all. Pray for me. Take me to the land of revival. Let's be committed. Let's serve the Lord with all our heart, all our soul, all our spirit, strength, body and mind. Let's serve him with all that we got. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. When you and I have been set free in Christ, we live in freedom. A little over 100 years ago, a man got on his knees and repented. Repented of his sins and committed his life. And he, he said to God, I don't understand anything. I don't know anything, but I'm committing myself to serve you with all my heart. When God did something in his heart, he opened his living room for others to come and be repentant. He led others to repentance. And as a group, they surrendered their whole heart and they got rid of the idols that consumed their heart and their heart's attention. They committed to serving the Lord with all their heart. And it is from that wellspring of revival, you and I are sitting here tonight. A hundred years ago, a man repentant with revival firing off in the chambers of his heart, started something. And as he led others into repentance, they committed to serving the Lord with all their heart. You and I are not just sitting in a building with people and furniture, but even the soil beneath our feet bears witness to what God did in this space over a hundred years ago. Let's not let that pass us by. Let's not take that for granted. Let's not be relaxed about it. Let's understand that if God did it before, he will do it again. All he needs is a repentant heart. All he needs is my whole heart. All he needs is that I get rid of my idols. All he needs is me to commit to serving him alone. Revival starts in the unseen chambers of your heart and my heart but it always flows to the visible landscape of your life and it'll transform it forever. I'll say that again. Revival always starts in the unseen, hidden chambers of your heart, but it will flow out of there and it'll change the visible landscape of your life. Well, how do we know that the unseen chambers of our life 
and the unseen chambers of our heart have been revived. Tonight, I want you and I invite you to look at the landscape of your life. Have a look at the landscape of your life. What do you see? Audit yourself. Have an awareness and let's be in a place, even as the worship team leads us in a, in a time of coming before God, repentant. Let's rise up to our feet. Let's look at the landscape of our life. What do we see? What do you see when you look at the landscape of your life? Do you see revival? Do you see revived areas? Do you see transformed areas? And if the answer is yes, good on you. Keep the fire burning. And if the answer is no, tonight the invitation is to come repent. To come surrender our hearts before God.